to those who are uh, on the other side of Atlantic from from United States. So really. We have uh, today a uh, very special uh, occasion to talk about uh, things which are happening not on the European continent, but on American continent, about uh, US forthcoming elections, which are really globally you know, very important. Let me introduce myself, first of all. My name is Andrew Kubilius. I'm a member of European Parliament from EPP Group uh, uh, from Lithuania. Uh, uh, I was and I am in politics since 1990s. I was two times prime minister, and uh, and uh, today, really, you know, it's it's uh, what we are trying to do. It's to have a, a small informal uh, discussion for uh, members of EPP group in the parliament and uh, to have possibility really to discuss uh, how things will develop in the United States of America. And uh, also, uh, you know, what we can predict and in any case, how, how things will develop after election. My pleasure is to introduce our two speakers and one is uh, Tibor Muzerges, who is the reason why we have this seminar. We know Tibor from, you know, uh, a uh, long period of time. Uh, uh, we had a lot of different activities uh, uh, since he is representing the National Republican Institute on the European continent. So, uh, good afternoon, Thibault. And recently we had very, very, very good seminar about his recent uh, book uh, on uh, the great class shift. Uh, so that was really very, very interesting and very important for us to understand how things are developing globally. Uh, in 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 political, you know, uh, redistribution of the voters or or, or classship, whatever, and also we have uh, uh, Sean Toner, managing partner from uh, Fulcrum Group, uh, Fulcrum. I don't know even how to uh, pronounce, but in any case, you know, very well known also uh, expert and specialist on communications, and and I can read the whole biography, you know. But uh, most important that he is from Colorado, and he was working uh, in different campaigns with uh, George W. Bush, uh, also in, in some uh, other countries, including in, in the European continent. And, and uh, definitely he knows uh, very well, you know, all, all, all things which are happening uh, now in the United States of America. So last week, why we, why we uh, also, one additional reason why we decided to have such a seminar, because exactly Thibault was organizing uh, another seminar on uh, forthcoming US elections. I was listening very carefully. And, uh, and the message which we got uh, you know, a week ago was that the battle is still very tight. Uh, if in uh, at least what I am reading you know, in, in European media, in the Lusanian media as well, uh, you know, Donald Trump is very much behind uh, Joe Biden in opinion polls. Uh, last week, we got uh, clear, clear information that things are not so, not so, how to say, easy or not so <laughs> clear, you know, uh, for Joe Biden. So, and my, my, you know, my suggestion is that we shall, uh, we shall start from uh, uh, Sean uh, Toner, uh, who will perhaps explain how, how, you know, the last week will go on. Uh, and really, we are demanding for a clear answer. So, who is going to win? <laughs> That's our, our 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 goal, you know. And and well, Sean, you should make your your, your statement, you know, up to ten or fifteen minutes. And then Tibor is ready to speak a little bit about uh, foreign policy issues. What what can be a difference, you know, and 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 things like that. So, Sean, please, the floor is yours. After that, we shall have Q and A, and and we shall we shall enjoy really. You know, free exchange of, of views about about really very important events. Fantastic! Thank you so much, and thank you again for uh, having me from across the pond. I think we're all getting very used to doing these Zoom meetings, um, which pre-coronavirus, I think only half of us knew how to do these. So um, I kind of break the election into a couple of key milestones. One was the the Democrat nomination process, which was a very crowded field. Um, you had extreme uh, left members of the party, more moderate members of the party battling it out. Um, and 
to the party's credit, they put forward the most viable candidate for November. Sometimes parties don't do that here in the United States or in Europe or, or elsewhere. And so Joe Biden was the nominee. Even with that, um, it was still an uphill battle. And you had coronavirus happen. The US economy was doing extremely well. Voter attitudes were generally positive. Now, the president has never enjoyed extreme favorability ratings. He, it's just his personality. He's someone who, you know, he, he throws the, the dynamite in the pond and kind of watch the ripples. And so uh, to use that analogy, so the, the president, but his, as far as right track, wrong track for the country and economic and security standpoint, Americans were generally very happy with the way the economy was going. Uh, everyone was benefiting. You had record wealth being created in retirement plans as well as individually. Coronavirus happens. Everything gets shut down across Europe, obviously, United States, the globe. The response to the coronavirus uh, pandemic here in the United States, Trump was, it was a day to day with his press briefings, whether folks felt, okay, we have a steady hand on the wheel or we don't. And then you had some of the fights starting with some of the governors out in the states, some of them warranted, some of them not warranted. We get through the summer months, Trump's numbers are continuing to do pretty well. Um, and then you get into Ruth Bader Ginsburg passing away. And I think Trump, at, Trump prior to Ruth Bader, the Supreme Court justice passing away, I think while the general populist polls and in, in the United States, when you look at these general polls, you have to look at them with a grain of salt because you have the two coasts, the West Coast and the East Coast of the country where the population is, but that's not how we elect our presidents. And so when you look at these polls and traditionally these polls oversample urban areas, but even if they didn't oversample urban areas, if you went just straight population, they're not representative of who actually has a chance at winning the presidency. Hence, while Donald Trump did not win the popular vote, but he won the electoral college against Hillary Clinton four years ago. Um, and so you have to really look at each individual state and the path to victory of how the candidates are gonna rack up the requisite number of states in order to have the majority of electoral college votes. And so Ruth Bader Ginsburg, her passing happened. The Republicans uh, were a little tone deaf or not respectful of grieving of the Supreme Court justice. And immediately we're talking about filling her vacancy. Um, and so they took a dip in the polls. And so had we been having this call uh, a month ago, I probably would have said, you know what, I think Joe Biden's probably gonna be the next president of the United States. Today, I have no idea. It's gonna be like, it's gonna be like four years ago. It's gonna be like Bush 2000. Um, Tivo and I remember those days, I was in Florida for the hanging chads and the recount and all the legal battles uh, at the Western United States for, for George W. Um, it's gonna be a very tight election. The United States is a 50-50 country. Um, a blowout would be if one candidate received 54, uh, 48, 46. Um, so it won't be a blowout by any stretch. I think it's probably gonna be a percentage point to two percentage points either way for Trump. And, and so since they put forward the new Supreme Court justice, the numbers have tightened back up because the American public generally likes her. They thought she was very articulate. Her hearings went very well. That helped Republican Senate candidates. Again, if we had this call a month ago, I have two clients who are US senators, Republicans running for reelection. It did not look good for either one of them. Both of them now are margin of error. So. Um, their polls have tightened back up. The interesting piece this time, again, we'll talk about coronavirus. In Colorado, where I live, we've had all mail voting, you vote by mail. We've had it for a decade. Most of the United States still has polling locations where you go and you physically vote in person. They're having to change that and mail out ballots. Um, and so the way people are voting this cycle for a lot of the battleground states is new by voting by mail. So it, there's not a lot of history on that to say, and the parties didn't have a lot of the infrastructure. I had 
the Republican Party of Texas and Florida and North Carolina and other states calling me asking, how do, how do you guys do ballot chase? How do you guys track down voters? I mean, and the Democrats are doing the same thing. Uh, my friends Axelrod and Carville on the other side, they're trying to train up these states. So right now, path to victory for Donald Trump, he has to win Florida, has to win Ohio. So when you're watching election night and Florida usually comes in first, if Biden wins Florida, you can turn off the TV. Biden's president of the United States. OK, so if Trump makes it through Florida, which right now it looks like he will make it through Florida, then all eyes are going to jump over to Ohio. Prior to that, they'll jump to Georgia. Georgia Trump needs to win as well. It's a southern state. Georgia has had a lot of racial uh, strife. They've had some police shootings, kind of like George Floyd, some civil unrest. Uh, the Senate race is very tight there. So Georgia is another one to watch. Assuming Trump wins Georgia, then all eyes are going to go to Ohio. Looks like Trump will win Ohio. Um, so then you go, okay, what happens next? Well, what happens next is Joe Biden um, needs to win Wisconsin and Michigan um, and potentially Pennsylvania. I think Trump's going to win Pennsylvania, uh, particularly from the last debate when the vice president said he was going to uh, ban fracking. The energy is a huge sector for the rural areas and suburban areas of, of Pennsylvania. So I think Biden will probably lose Pennsylvania. His current polling is uh, worse than what Hillary Clinton was projected to win. So, and Trump won Pennsylvania last time by 0.8%. So I think Trump probably wins Pennsylvania. Trump probably wins North Carolina, but if Biden, Biden wins Michigan and Wisconsin, um, then he'll look out West for Arizona, our neighbors out here in Colorado, or he's gonna to look to Ohio uh, to get to victory. If you're watching election night and Trump pulls off like he did last time, a win in either Michigan or Wisconsin, you can turn off the TV, Donald Trump's the next, or the continuing to be the president of the United States. So that's really to watch election night. Trump's gotta make the, the fence in Florida, then he's gotta jump the fence in Georgia, he's gotta jump the fence in Ohio, if he does that, then it's it's going to be interesting watching those. But those are really the only states to watch. The rest of the states um, are either going to go for the Republican or for the Democrat. Those are the states uh, for the Electoral College. Um, there was an interesting, and, and I'll, I'll drop it over to Tiba, but there was an interesting uh, a poll that was done by the Lounge Group out of, uh, out of Hungary, out of Budapest. And they partnered with Signal, which I think is probably one of the top three polling firms in the United States. Um, and they did a poll uh, about a month ago and they polled Hungarians um, to get kind of the European perspective. And then they polled Americans. There was roughly 2,500 in the sample size, 2,000 US, 500 Hungarians. And yeah, they, they polled, who do you think is gonna win? The Hungarians thought Trump was gonna win in a landslide. Um, so it's interesting how the media gets pushed in certain areas. But then more importantly, they, they tested the psyche uh, and emotions and what emotions people are feeling. And it was interesting in the United States, the emotions, 76% were feeling fear, fear for economic security because of coronavirus and what's happening with the economy, and then fear for civil unrest. And Hungarians, it was uh, security around the family. And so it was just kind of interesting, you know, it wasn't as much economic security in Hungary as it was the United States being the number one issue. Um, I think, you know, the last two nights we've had civil unrest again in Philadelphia, we had another shooting of a uh, unarmed African-American. And again, that'll be interesting how that plays out uh, in, the, uh, in the election. Early ballot returns right now, um, it depends state by state. State I'm in right now, the Democrats have superior technology of tracking and, and turning in votes. And they've got a lot of voter intensity. Um, and so you can look at polls, but then just look at raw ballots, Republicans versus Democrats, who's returned their ballots. And here in Colorado, Democrats are outstripping Republicans by 9%, just as a percentage of the party, not overall ballot totals, just percentages, which shows either Republicans are holding back their ballots or what I think is more accurate, the Democrats have a better machine of getting those ballots back. So, um, but that's not every state, that's Colorado, you know, it could be different in Florida. In fact, it is different in Florida. 
Um, but so I would love to tell you who's going to win election night. I was, I was telling my friends before we uh, open it up for everyone. I, in uh, four years ago, I was on record uh, at least a dozen times saying there's no way Donald Trump gets elected president. So whatever I say, you can, uh, they got him on this side of the pond because I don't have to buy you all beers tonight. <laughs> okay, Sean. So thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Really. Uh, it's, it's amazing, you know, really how, how, how American political process you explain, you know, what, what you watch and, and, and how things are still un unpredictable, you know, so yeah. let's, yeah, let's, let's, let's look what, what, what will happen. So, uh, Tibor, now I would I would like to ask you. you now, maybe you will you will tell about a little bit about what's uh, what's uh, uh, you know what what uh, we should expect on the European continent. You know, from uh, election outcome, and uh, what what uh, what is the difference in in you know in uh, in Joe Biden? Hello. Can anyone hear me? Because Andreas, I think I've lost you. you. You can hear me. Okay. Yep, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, so I guess everybody else can hear me. Uh, I, I lost Andreas at, at, at some point. So I'll, I'll just, you know, Andreas will forgive me if I, uh, if, if I cut you. First of all, I just would like to say thank you. Uh, thank you very much to Andreas for, for inviting me. And thank you, Sean, uh, for, uh, for getting me, for, for coming to, to, this, uh, 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 to this talk. You have to understand that Sean is kind of my mentor in American politics. Uh, so a, a lot of things that I know in US politics is thanks to Sean back uh, 15, 20 years ago when we, uh, when we started working together. And that was, uh, at least as far as I'm concerned, in, in, in another life. Um, as, as Andrea said, I'm in a, uh, um, I, I represent the International Republican Institute. Uh, however, in this particular occasion, on this particular seminar, uh, I am going to, to talk in my, in, in my personal uh, uh, quality, so to speak, as uh, IRI is not supposed to do politics in the United States, and I will not do politics in the United States, but I, I, want, I want to have this disclaimer to make sure that something that I say does not you know, come back and haunt me uh, in, a, in, a, in a few uh, hours or, or a few months time. So um, I'm going to talk about something that is actually uh, somewhat of, a, of, of a non-issue in, in, in inside America right now, because the, the reality is that if, if you look at the, the, the debate, and, and Sean, feel free to uh, contradict me if you, if, if you feel that it's not the case, but the feeling that I have is that contrary to, uh, to, to other, you know, other uh, uh, elections in America, but contrary to what it was uh, four years ago, uh, this has been really an, all, an American only issue. Uh, there has been very, very, very little talk uh, of foreign actors. There's been very, very little talk of foreign policy. Uh, I think it's sometimes, you know, uh, some actors would have loved to have a support from, uh, you know, from one or other uh, uh, leaders from outside. But frankly, American people do not care this, these days. And I, I think uh, uh, there's a very good reason for that is that, you know, Americans have a lot of uh, uh, issues to, 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 to face, to take care about right now. And uh, the, the, the debate is about the economy. Uh, it's about race. Uh, it's about civil unrest. Uh, it, it's about stuff that, that, that are inside America. So uh, in many ways, uh, and, and as we, President Trump take, having COVID uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, took us one debate down, uh, there were two debates instead of three, uh, we, we basically practically didn't talk at all about foreign policy uh, over, the, uh, over, the past, uh, over the past three weeks or over the past two months. And, you know, in some ways there is, there is a reason for that, which is that uh, uh, candidates are, are, are supposedly known quantities in terms of, you know, what their foreign policy should be. Uh, Joe Biden articulated uh, his uh, aspirations for American foreign policy in a, uh, in a long article in Foreign Affairs uh, uh, or in Foreign Policy, sorry, uh, a, a few uh, a few months ago during the spring. Uh, uh, Donald Trump has been president for four years, and there's, you know, uh, people pretty much know what he's about, when he, how he's shaping his foreign policy. Uh, however, that being said, uh, uh, people are not, this is, people know what they can expect when they, you know, put their ballot in. Uh, but what uh, an American president does is not only shaped by his views of the world, 
uh, but also by events. Uh, the one very good example is George W. Bush, who was elected in 2000 as a president who would take care mostly of America and recenter uh, 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 attention on, on American affairs. And then basically uh, nine months into his presidency, uh, we got into 9-11, uh, the terrorist attacks on the, on the World Trade Center, and that changed completely uh, uh, the, the, the presidency of, of, of George W. Bush. So um, there, there, there are actually right now uh, disagreements over what uh, uh, the uh, uh, what what a, a Biden presidency or what a Trump presidency, a Trump two presidency can be, and in general, I would I would start with the one who is uh, uh, the favorite, although marginally right now, as uh, as 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 Sean uh, uh, said earlier on, which is you know Joe Biden. What happens if Joe Biden uh, gets elected president? And uh, the, there are actually you you would find in Washington two schools of thought uh, on this. The first one is. Uh, 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 sort of the back to normal uh, uh, thesis that is basically saying that Joe Biden, you know, after uh, four years of roller coaster uh, of, of, of Trump foreign policy that basically broke all the codes of, of American foreign policy over the from the past 20 to 30 years, uh, Joe Biden. Yeah, it looks like we lost Tibo. Yeah, we lost Tibo. So maybe we shall wait while uh, maybe Tibo will reconnect. So we sure. can start, Jan, uh, Sean, we can start with uh, questions, you know, if you hear me. Yeah. Yeah, because I was lost also for some time. So still, still technologies are, yeah. uh, uh, you know, not perfect from that point of view. But we hope that Tibor will come back, you know, and, and we shall continue on foreign policy. On uh, are you are you able to say anything about what can make the major impact during the last week, you know, uh, for election outcome? As you hear any kind of single, you know, specific uh, factors like economy or pandemic, what what will what what will be the the biggest, you know, influence? Yeah, you know, right now what's happening um, in a number of states is we're having a, a slight surge in coronavirus cases. And so uh, you're having governors institute more lockdown of people staying at home, uh, less uh, gatherings at restaurants and, and bars and uh, stuff of that nature. I think that will remind folks that we're still in the pandemic. Uh, a month ago, folks were feeling like, okay, it's kind of behind us. I think the other piece is um, the announcement of the vaccines and they're starting the uh, trials on the vaccines in two weeks. So I think that gives people hope. Um, you know, so I think coronavirus is still gonna be front and center. Um, and the, the other piece that's playing in right now, and I agree with Tebow, the foreign policy really took a a backseat in the debates um, over the last uh, month of the campaign. The one piece that stayed front and center, particularly on the uh, moderates to conservatives, so the Republicans and then the, the moderates, has been China, um, both because of where the virus emanated from, but also um, you have Hunter Biden's laptop and taking uh, money from the Chinese potentially being the story that blew up this last week, as well as China trade. Um, so I think if there's one country that Americans are really kind of focusing on right now, it's China. Um, and I think whether it's a Biden presidency or a, a Trump second term, um, I think China is gonna be probably front and center as far as uh, foreign policy. But I, this final, you know, it's really coming down now to who has the better get out the vote machine in the individual states? Both parties have ample amount of resources. I think the spending is going to be somewhere north of uh, $2.5 billion for each campaign, if you put it all together. So both sides have plenty of money. Now it's who can get their people to the polls. 
Well, Sean, thanks a lot. I don't know if your voice is coming back or not, uh, but... I am back. Not... I am back. Oh, yeah. Too. Yeah, okay. So can you continue on, on sorry. foreign policy? Then? Yeah. Yeah, sure. So, so sorry, I was uh, uh, rudely interrupted by by uh, 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 Slovak 4G. Um, so yeah, I mean, the first school of thought is you know the back to normal agenda. Uh, the the second school of thought is basically which which I think makes makes a lot of sense as well, uh, is to say nothing will be the same again. That after the presidency, the Trump presidency, uh, a lot of things have changed, uh, and that the Trump presidency basically initiated or continued trends that were already an undercurrent in American foreign policy, uh, and that basically different actors are going to need to adapt, uh, to adapt to changing circumstance. And uh, uh, there is, uh, uh, I think for Europe, there is uh, uh, definitely uh, some truth to that in the sense that uh, the center of the world is no longer Europe. Uh, when you look at it from a, an economical you know, economic, geopolitical perspective, the attention really now is on East Asia and, and pretty much, you know, Soon, sooner rather than later, the Indo-Pacific, uh, and uh, actually, COVID is accelerating this uh, 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 this tendency. There is a real risk that uh, I'm, I'm sorry that I'm saying that you know it so bluntly, but being a European, maybe I can say that the risk is that Europe is going to be the real the real loser in this in in, in this pandemics, and and American foreign policy is going to shift probably to continue to shift more towards Asia and the, and the Pacific and, and probably less towards Europe. It doesn't mean that the transatlantic relationship is, is threatened in any more efforts to be made uh, so that we can find ways to, uh, 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 to, to, to work together. So that, that's the, 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 the Biden scenario. For the, the Trump scenario, there's basically three, uh, three schools of thought. The first one is that we get more of the same. Uh, basically, you know, uh, if you liked or disliked uh, uh, what you saw the, over the past four years, this is pretty much going to be the same uh, in the next in the next four years. Um, that's uh, what logic would like to dictate, and I think in many ways you will, if if, if President Trump is reelected, you will hear again uh, uh, talks about uh, about trade, uh, talks about. Uh, uh, you know, allies ripping uh, America off. That's that's something that these are views that are held by the president that have been held by the president for uh, for many years. I mean, you could hear him in the in the 1980s say that that kind of things about Japan, for example. Um, so that's one school of thought. The other school of thought will say that well, Trump is going to get used to you know to his role and to the, the work that he's done in in uh, uh, around the world. And and some some of the some of the work has been positive. I mean, we've seen uh, uh, we've seen the the efforts in the Middle East have uh, have brought to uh, uh, to to the normalizing of relations between a number of of Muslim states and Israel. Um, and 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 you know basically moving on this. The idea is that moving from these uh, foreign policy uh, uh, wins, so to speak, uh, Donald Trump gets more inserted in the in, in, in the international system. And the the third one is that uh, is, is basically saying that Trump, uh, President Trump, uh, 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 not only continues in the same direction as he's going, but he feels comforted by uh, uh, the, the confidence, the vote of confidence from from the Americans uh, or, or from, you know, the, 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 the states that will have voted for him and then doubles down on, uh, uh, on, uh, on his policy and, and, and becomes more aggressive on a number of things. He would look more like a back to business uh, 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 thing with, you know, the president continuing the course that he's that, that he's on. Uh, if uh, Vice President Biden uh, is elected, I, it seems to me that we are more towards the second scenario, which is that things, whatever, whatever the, the, the talks are going to be in Washington, uh, uh, there are going to be some fundamental changes uh, in American foreign policy. And, uh, and, and Europe is going to need to adapt, which uh, it was very, uh, it was not very keen to adapt over the past uh, the past four years, and it will have to. And I think uh, uh, one one sign that that the lesson has been learned, I think, is the, uh, uh, coming from the the, uh, the discourse that came uh, this weekend by um, uh, Anna Gret Kramp, Karen Bauer, uh, about uh, about the, this call for a renewal of the uh, of the transatlantic leadership. And I think uh, I think this is a sign 
uh, uh, that at least uh, uh, some people in in Berlin and in Brussels uh, have understood and 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 will uh, uh, will start to 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 rethink with America uh, uh, the transatlantic uh, uh, foreign policy. There's a lot to talk about. There's a lot to do. There are some dialogues that are going to be pretty easy, others that are going to be very difficult. Uh, the one that is going to be very difficult that's coming up is about Turkey. Uh, but um, I think there's, uh, uh, there is there is room right now for for this renewal of, of, of the transatlantic alliance, whoever wins the, uh, uh, the US presidential election. Well, uh... Thanks a lot, Ibo. Thanks a lot. So now, really, if, if uh, we shall not fail with, with connections... That, that, that's open. pretty much it for me. Yeah. We can open uh, the floor for, for questions and answers. And I see some, some people are, are writing on chat. That's correct to know, uh, to write your questions. Some people are asking the floor. I hope that our, our team, Jonas, will be able uh, to give, uh, to give you know, to unmute those who want to ask directly. But the first question, which I see very practical from Isabel Wissel uh, Lima, our colleague, a member of parliament, a very practical question around what time can we expect to have trustful results of the different states that will determine uh, for the outcome of the elections? So I don't know, Sean or, or Tibor, sure. uh, who can explain <laughs> and who can, you know, uh, wh 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 when, when election results uh, are, are coming, you know, to be, to be seen? Yeah, so the, uh, the election results, and again, one of the benefits of coronavirus, now that more states are going to all mail balloting, they're already processing votes right now. So uh, come seven o'clock, that's when polls uh, traditionally close in all the states. So 7 p.m. on the Eastern time zone. So Florida would be the first one, election day. Uh, 7 p.m., you'll start to have results come in. Now. I'll do a, a caveat or an asterisk. Both parties are going to file lawsuits probably about middle of the day on election day to keep polls open. And they're going to file lawsuits to keep polls open in areas that benefit them. So the Democrats will file for Dade County. Republicans will file for Tallahassee. I'm talking about Florida. Um, and judges will have to hear that on an expedited whether or not to keep polls open. And that will go throughout the night. But uh, starting election night at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, um, you, you'll start to have the results uh, coming across. I wouldn't pay a lot of attention to exit polls at all, quite frankly, because so many people are voting by mail. They're not actually going to a voting location. So if you're watching a news site talking about exit polls, just change the channel. Watch, you know, Happy Days or something like that, because you're not going to get anything from it. But um but seven o'clock election night. And then uh, from that standpoint, you know, CNN, Fox News, I would switch back and forth because it's just kind of fun to hear how both sides talk up, you know, how they're going to have a path to victory. Um, and then uh, another good website that tracks uh, nightly is realclearpolitics.com. So it aggregates. And as you're leading up towards the election, um, it has a lot of good opinion pieces from all over the country, both on foreign policy, domestic policy, but also it has all your poll tracking to see if the Republicans are gonna hold the Senate. Um, I don't believe we're gonna win the House by any stretch. So the House will be held by the Democrats. Nancy Pelosi will continue to be the speaker. Um, the Senate could go either way. Um, and then obviously the presidency. Yeah, okay, Sean, yeah, you answered my, my, my you know, question, which I was going to ask you about, <laughs> about what's about the House and what's about the Senate, so you, <laughs> you explain yeah. more or less, you know. So now we have, I see Nathan Shapura, uh, who would like to ask the question. I, I, I'm asking Jonas, can you unmute uh, Nathan Shapura? I'm unmuted. Good, and I, I just uh, will, will end with, with uh, technical comments. That it would be good if, if others would put your... You no, know, your questions or your request for the question on, on chat. Yeah, please, Nathan. Thanks so much. Thanks for this initiative and thanks to our speakers. I have a question for each of our speakers. First to Sean Tonner. Uh, first, uh, less seriously, uh, I'm a native of Birmingham, Alabama, so I'm wondering, uh -huh. is that a Crimson Tide helmet behind you? 
But Roll you know, Tide. I'm actually an Auburn fan, but but uh, but I'll support the Tide. Right? <laughs> um, but more seriously, you didn't mention or you didn't focus so much in your initial narrative of the last year or so on the issue of law and order or, or racial protest in the swings of the of the polling cycle, let's say. And I, it's interesting, I didn't hear the phrase law and order in the most recent debate. So I was wondering what you thought of how this particular issue has has helped you know, either either campaign, let's say. And then to Thibault, a more qualitative question, and that is, it, it strikes me that one of the main issues that, that that Europeans and Americans both need to be focusing on now in the next several months is how to reinvigorate the transatlantic partnership relationship. And, and in particular, what's the story we want to be telling? And I wonder, I've been thinking about this a lot, maybe maybe the story we're telling needs needs to be rethought, needs, ref, needs to be refreshed, it needs to be updated maybe so that it's not just a story about defeating totalitarianism from the from the Second World War, from the Cold War, but also from the last 30 years and, and now moving forward. So how would you how would you begin to think about sort of a, 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 re, a renewed or reformulated transatlantic story? So um, uh, as far as the where law and order falls in the in the spectrum, um, I would say if if Trump wins re-election, it will be because of law and order. Um, if you look at suburban Republican women voters, which are the most uh, apt to move, they voted for Barack Obama in 2008. Um, their number one issue was personal security. Number two issue was economic security. Personal security was all revolving around the civil unrest they were seeing and the looting and the rioting. And so Trump actually had an uptick, Republicans had an uptick in uh, June, July and August post the Floyd death. Um, and then it kind of stabilized. And I think what you're seeing in Philadelphia reminds folks a little bit. So uh, it, it'll be interesting uh, post-mortem on the election when you sit down with focus groups and you say, well, you don't like Donald Trump as a human being or a person, and you don't want to have him over for dinner, why'd you vote for him? It'll probably be because they felt he was more apt to give law and order, rule of law, than Joe Biden. Yeah, okay, Sean, and, and Thibault, what's about your answer? Like he froze up again. Yeah, again, again, some, some problems. So, uh, do we have any, any other Thibault? Yeah, everything is frozen, I see. I think we have so a question you? about uh, racial injustice on the upcoming election. Um, again, kind of dovetailing on the law and order. I think the reason one of the reasons you're seeing, at least, for example, in my state where Democrats are more energized to get their ballots back in, I think it's pent up frustration and anger towards Donald Trump and it's allowing them to manifest by getting their vote in. I think it's also the racial injustice. I think Americans, the majority of Americans are ready to take a step forward as with race relations where they've kind of just been on the back burner. And I think uh, people uh, of all stripes, I mean, I see Republicans, Democrats, all talking about what reforms do we need to do with our police system? Uh, what reforms do we need to do with our judicial system? Um, it's been interesting. And another thing to watch uh, as you're watching polls, um, watch Donald Trump's percentage of the African-American vote. It's If he ends up getting 15% or greater, of the African-American vote, it's very difficult for Joe Biden to win election. And right now, Trump's polling anywhere from 13 to 20% of the African-American vote. So that's a key demographic to watch um, And uh, uh, as we go into election day. But I think the, the racial injustice, I think obviously plays stronger um, with younger voters and it plays stronger with moderates and Democrat voters but it's playing across the spectrum. So, yeah, thanks a lot, Sean. I understood that you answered also Lisa, Lisa Brenner question, mm -hmm. uh, which you can chat because I was lost also. Yeah. Connection is terrible. I don't know what is happening. Yeah. 
Yeah, so you, you answered that question. Good. Mm -hmm. And Tibor, are we, are we, do we have Tibor? Tibor is lost. Uh, yeah, for time being, I do not see him. Can yeah, you hear me? Him. Yep. Yeah, okay, good. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so to, to, to answer your question, uh, Nathan, I think, um, I think we need to, to wake up to the fact that the, the transatlantic relationship probably overslept uh, a little bit in the past uh, before uh, the election of Donald Trump. And, and, and I think you're right to say there is a, a sort of need for uh, some sort of, uh, of reboot. Um, and, and that reboot, I think, uh, whatever happens will need to to happen on a different basis. I mean, I think we, we talked a lot about uh, uh, democracy and, uh, uh, and values and, and, and those continue to be to be important. But it seems to me that that we need to uh, also to talk about interests and, and, and share the interests. And uh, 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 that's that's sort of re very kind of realistic or very realist uh, uh, positioning. But I think taking this this positioning, it makes it easier to make the case with the realists on both sides, because you, you actually have Democrats who are realists, and uh, uh, you could see you could see that you know, for example, the the, the Obama administration was was by no means uh, a, a one hundred percent idealistic administration, and uh, I, I think on on our side, on, on the European side, uh, showing that. Uh, making the making the case with the transatlantic relationship is something, but showing that that we are uh, that we are doing something for ourselves, and and showing also that America uh, uh, America pulling out of Europe uh, uh, is going to have to pay a price. And I'm going to give you a, a, a very simple example. Um, uh, you hear obviously a lot Donald Trump, President Trump, talking about the Americans not spending enough on defense. Uh, the thing is, obviously, in in his mind and in the minds of many, you know, the, 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 in America, the, the defense spendings uh, also have to be uh, uh, like it is right now in uh, in the spending on on buying American equipment, um, except that if Europeans start to 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 spend more, it is very likely that they are going to spend more. Not only on American goods and American equipment, but also on on, on European uh, military industry. And you know, if I mean uh, that that you know, when when uh, uh, when in the, the export people in the in the U.S. Uh, uh, defense industry uh, realize that, which many have actually have already. Yeah, okay. Uh, then there's going to be some thoughts about, oh, wait a minute. Uh, maybe we, you know, maybe we need to keep engaged in a different way. So I, I think that, you know, if, if, if Europe becomes more assertive uh, while uh, and, and, and focuses on interests, while uh, uh, at the same time showing its, its capacity to act on its own. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, yeah we we are losing some from from time to time. Your your connection, it looks like. But Sean is still here. Yes. Oh, yes. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. And I think to to piggyback what Tibo said, yeah. I think I think there's absolutely been a a shift that's been growing uh, probably over the last six years, but sped up over the last four years um, with Americans uh, looking more to the east than to the to the west and I, I the focus um, of of China and China's influence whether it be in uh, Africa 
uh, Central Asia, Latin America. I think Americans are, you know, becoming more focused on China where, you know, 10 years ago, it was absolutely how are our allies in Europe viewing us? How are we working with our allies in Europe? Um, you know, some of it on our southern border because of narcotics and other stuff, trade. Um, but I would say definitely the focus is, is towards China, particularly uh, during the Trump administration. Yeah, okay, so we're waiting still on new, new questions to come. But I have, you know, very simple question, Jan. Uh, so if Donald Trump is, is, is continuing, you know, to be as a president, what, what we can expect, you know, both in domestic policy, it will be different, changes will come, or, or it will continue to be the same? And then on foreign policy, maybe Tibor, if, if he's still connected, you know, can elaborate a little bit, because, well, again, we are, sometimes we're complaining in Europe, you know, that Trump is, is, is bad in foreign policy, that he is not respecting Europe and so on. But being not a very diplomat, you know, and, mm -hmm. and not a, and a big expert on, on global foreign policy, what I see, what Trump managed to achieve, for example, during the last half a year, uh, let's say, you know, making agreement in between of Serbia and Kosovo on European continent. In Washington, D.C., not, not in Brussels, but in Washington, D.C. There are an agreement in between of Israel and some Arab countries, you know, new, new additional countries. For me, it looks like quite a big achievement. I don't know, you know, if, uh, if, if that will, uh, you know, continue, if things will, will really, you know, in between of Serbia and Kosovo will continue to, be, to improve. But that was done by, by Trump approach, which is different from, you know, traditional uh, foreign policy and in diplomacy, he came with clear message. If you will agree, guys, I will give you, you know, quite a big, uh, you know, investment, money, and so on and so on. So I see, I see that as a promising, promising, you know, approach. And and well, you know, and, and 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 my question then is, if Trump is staying in power, what's your prediction? He will continue similar things, or or we should, we should expect some some kind of change in his style and his in his you know, policy approach and so on and so on. So first I can tell you absolutely his style is not going to change. I, <laughs> that's, Trump is Trump. Um, yeah. I have, um, my daughter works in DC and two of her friends help write his tweets every day and he checks all the tweets. I mean, it's, anyway. So uh, as far as Trump's second term, what to predict, I, a couple things. You're going to see a, a, a infrastructure bill get passed. Um, Democrats, Republicans, governors want this in the states. Again, the governors are the CEOs of these large economies throughout the United States. Everybody wants an infrastructure bill, which means, you know, more clean energy. It means uh, more roads, means new bridges. We need to invest in our infrastructure. Um, and so that would be number one, I would say, on the on the Trump. We need to figure out our health care system. We, we don't want socialized medicine but we also don't want the system right now because it's when you're having five to 15% increases every year for the same procedures, it's not sustainable. It, it, the economy can't withstand that. So those would be the two. On foreign policy, I, the one that surprised me other than some of the relations being normalized in, in Jared Kushner's work in, in the Middle East was I thought for sure we were gonna have a showdown between Mexico and the United States and the actual opposite has happened. Uh, Orbador and Trump, even though they're polar opposites of the philosophical spectrum, get along really well. And, and Orbador realizes he needs the United States. The United States realizes we need Mexico. If we're gonna combat some of the Chinese, if we're gonna put the tariffs on China, we've gotta get our goods made somewhere and then we gotta to look to the South. Um, so I think you're going to see a even stronger relationship with Mexico and Central America. Um, and then I would predict you're going to see the U.S. out of Afghanistan. I think Trump will want to make that a hallmark, that he was the president who got us out of our longest war we've been engaged in in our history, which is Afghanistan. So I think Trump will expedite total withdrawal from Afghanistan. And then um, I would say the United States will, and this is where I think Europe is critical, will really put the vice on Iran between the other Arab states, 
keeping Israel kind of in the background, uh, the European Union and Russia. You have to have all those players at the table uh, to get Iran uh, back to normalized relations uh, with with much of the globe. So that would be, I guess that was five. Those would be my five predictions. But Trump's not going to change his style. I can guarantee you that. Okay, I see. Uh, so I don't know if, if Tibor wants to jump now or we lost him totally. I, I do not see anything on, on this. I'm here. I'm here. Yeah, okay, good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so very quickly, I mean, I, I agree with Sean. Um, I think uh, you're, the, the most likely thing is that you're going to get more of the same bar, any big change. Uh, you know, we have to remember that Trump uh, in his first term has been saying out loud and, and, and you know, very, you know, sometimes very vocally uh, what uh, a lot of policymakers in Washington were, had been thinking for a long time. And that, that's partly with regards to, uh, to Europe. I, I'm just quoting a, a prominent member, uh, a prominent diplomat in the, uh, in the Obama administration, that Vic, that's Victoria Nuland, for, for, for which I have a, a, a lot of, of, of sympathy and respect. But uh, during the Ukraine crisis, she's the one who said, and for, forgive the profanity, fuck the EU, uh, because you know, the Americans were so frustrated with uh, uh, the lack of response from, uh, from the Europeans. And I, I think things are getting better on that score. And uh, uh, even though there are, you know, uh, there, are, uh, there are criticism that come, that come here and there, I think that the response so far from European uh, uh, ind individual, at least states about Huawei, has been very, uh, uh, I, I think, have been, you know, on something that really, really, really does matter for the United States of America. You may, you know, criticize the style, you may criticize the reasons uh, uh, behind it, but uh, uh, the fact that uh, a lot of countries, and not only in Central Europe, I mean, now it's no longer New Europe versus New Europe, uh, uh, New Europe versus Old Europe. Uh, a lot, the fact that a lot of states uh, have. Thanks also to COVID, uh, uh, you know, woken up to the 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 the, the threat that represent that China represents has been uh, uh, something uh, uh, that ha that I think will be very encouraging uh, uh, for 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 Washington for the 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 future of the the transatlantic relationship. As far as the the you know what the. Uh, uh, the priorities of, of the Trump administration would be uh, if President Trump gets reelected. I think uh, uh, the main priority, I mean, the, fir the first term is always a term where you try to, to put your print on foreign policy. The second term is one where you try to build a legacy. And, and to that extent, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure that the Middle East is going to, to be very high in the, the priority list for, uh, for President Trump, if only because America is still sufficient right now in, in terms of, 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 the, of, of, of energy. So, you know, maybe to get a, a Nobel Peace Prize, which I think he will never get, uh, uh, because, you know, the, it's people in Oslo who are giving out the, the Nobel Peace Prize. I, I don't think that's going to be the, uh, uh, the priority for, 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 for President Trump. The priority is going to be China. Uh, probably Venezuela as well, uh, in terms of the uh, because it's so close and it's uh, it's a thorn in the foot of Uncle Sam. Um, Iran, because you know, just because there's a there's 30 years of history uh, behind that, and, and Republicans do not forget their history, at least not as much as the as the Democrats. But the main thing is going to be China, and I think for 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 a Biden presidency, it's going to be exactly the same. America has woken up to the Chinese challenge. Uh, uh, probably, I mean, and you can say that, you know, President Trump actually played a, a, a very big role in that. Uh, and, and now it's going to be the, the, the main uh, uh, the, the, the main lens from which American policymakers are going to make their foreign policy. It's going to be China, 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 China. So uh, even when it comes to the, the, uh, uh, the policy with Russia, I think there's, you know, there, there might, there, there's going to be a tendency uh, from uh, a Trump administration, definitely, uh, to, to try and see if ever the Russians are making, you know, some, uh, some moves uh, against China, we're going to see where, uh, uh, where we can, you know, where we can give back something. It's probably not going to be in Europe because I think that uh, uh, America and, and, and Russia in Europe are really on a collision course when it comes to uh, when it comes to Ukraine, when it comes to Georgia, but right now, for example, the heat is on Armenia and Azerbaijan. So that you know, that may be that may be something where where an American administration is you know might be more ready uh, uh, to look away uh, uh, if if again if uh, uh, Russia is ready to move in, in a certain direction. So um, again, I think 
the, 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 the tone that, that has been set by, by President Trump in, in his first term has been a, a very Jacksonian sort of diplomacy. So uh, uh, it's like you give, I give, uh, very transactional. I, I don't see any reason why this should change in uh, a, a second, uh, a hypothetical second term of Donald Trump. So thanks a lot, Thibault. And here we have, uh, again, question from Isabel uh, Wisseler. Uh, member for Parliament, and, uh, and the question is uh, very interesting. What is the interest of Trump uh, that the European Union is weakened? So, Thibault, can you answer? And maybe Sean can answer. I don't know. Both of you will know. Yeah. Uh, we, we uh, very cool European with American relations, and Sean has America. <laughs> yeah. Very, very, but, very, short, very short answer. Uh, I think this is, you know, this is something that is uh, uh, that, that that I personally regret. Uh, among uh, our Republican crowds, uh, this uh, 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 sort of not only disinterest but uh, very much a suspicion about about the EU. Uh, I think some of it is also transposition of uh, uh, of American political thoughts. Remember that Republicans in general are suspicious when central government in Washington gets more powers uh, and, and, and they see the EU as something that it, it, it actually is not. They see the EU as a sort of uh, big Leviathan that is that is building itself that, I don't know, spends 30% of European GDP, which, which it is not. So I, I think part of the part of the reason for that is uh, uh, of this distrust is that there has been uh, very little effort uh, on the part of European policymakers, or not enough effort on the part of European policymakers to make that the case for the European Union and to debunk some myth uh, among conservative groups and conservative thinkers in in Washington. And again, remember that uh, you know, for for the, the the general public in Colorado, in in California, anywhere you want, uh, these people people don't give a damn about about the EU. I mean, you ask about the EU in, in, in the United States, they don't care. People care only in Washington, and and people. And I, I, it seems to me that that there would be there there should be more investment. Uh, and particularly if Trump is not, if President Trump is not reelected, there should be a time to invest in relationships in uh, uh, in places like places like Cato Institute, like uh, 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 other other conservative think tanks to just play the case. You may not like us, but we're actually credible and 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 uh, 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 and reliable allies. And uh, uh, I, th I think what's going on right now with regards to China is probably a uh, positive sign that that we can build on for the future so that uh, 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 Republican policymakers are more uh, sympathetic to Europe. And here I'm speaking not at all as, as uh, an, an American, but as a, as a European who cares and who, uh, who cares about Europe and who believe in the, in the European project. Okay, good. Maybe John would like to add something about why Americans are looking into EU in such a way. Like yeah, Isabel I, I, I think, Thibault is so spot on. Um, I think regardless, uh, Trump or Biden, I think there's some um, improvements that need to be uh, made here, particularly in Washington, DC, but also out in the States. Um, because for many states, European countries are significant trading partners with these individual states. And I think strengthening those bonds, I think the general populace in the United States uh, feels very favorable uh, about Europe. I mean, if you ask them where they want to travel to outside the beaches of Mexico, everybody wants to go to Europe. I mean, everybody wants to go to Paris. They want to go to Oktoberfest. They want to go to Italy. And I know I'm missing a lot of countries, but it's, but the Americans, I think, look at Europeans as rightly so, most Americans as our cousins. You know, myself, I was born in Germany. My family's from, from Hamburg. And so it, it, a lot of Americans can draw a direct line over to Europe, as opposed to other parts of the world in large portions. I think China, um, China is absolutely an area where the EU and the US should be working hand in glove together to develop policies uh, that promote our shared values, which is democracy, freedom of the press, um, rule of law, um, those things. And I think that's where you know, the, the healing, if there, if there's fractured relations, um, I think that's where they could definitely come to bear. Because if you put, 
the European economy alongside the U.S. economy. Um, that's that's a powerhouse, you know. And then you throw in Canada, maybe or Mexico, and then now, now we're talking. But and and I think you know you would have allies in Asia as well with Australia, the Philippines, and Japan and South Korea. And so I think you could you could have a consortium, but led by the U.S. and Europe, you could have a consortium that would excite me. I think um, you know Iran is another area that as we figure out what's their place in the global uh, uh, global construct. You know, Europe is obviously has normalized, many countries have normalized relations with Iran. They could absolutely be a significant player as the U.S. is trying to figure out how do we get back to a positive relationship with Iran and, and have them not spending the money that they do um, backing bad actors. Okay, Sean, uh, yeah, thanks a lot. So I do not see any more questions. So maybe I will put the last one, you know, <laughs> and, and we shall conclude uh, since really appreciate very much your, your time, you know, and Sean, mm -hmm. early in the morning, we are, you know, in the afternoon. So, uh, but my question, maybe I will continue on this, you know, China uh, issue. Uh, I was very much impressed uh, when I watched uh, on, on YouTube, you know, Marco Rubio speech. It's 2018, 2018, I don't remember even which, which year, but exactly on China, something like 20 minutes, and, uh, and I understood very well what, what challenges Americans see, you know, toward China. Uh, and uh, my question is very simple, you know, uh, and maybe for, to, first of all, to Thibault, who knows a little bit Europe, because I'm quite surprised that in Europe still, you know, our language is like, okay, Americans are fighting with China because China is becoming a big economical power. Uh, you, you know, states want to stay as number one economy. And, and, and that is the reason why, you know, US is fighting with China. We Europeans are, you know, since uh, quite many years, you know, number three as economy, mm -hmm. and we are not fighting for the leadership. And that is why, in this, you know, fight of the U.S. Uh, you know, with, with China, we shall try to be somewhere in, in between, you know, intermediate. Which is what I saw from Marco Rubio and from others. No, it's not only economy, but it's, what is really, you know, uh, the challenge. It's, it's, it's a challenge that China, which is becoming really a strong economy, also will become a strong geopolitical player. And that is where, you know, our, our common interest would be to look, you know, how this new geopolitical power with authoritarian regime, you know, uh, will behave globally. And uh, my question to, to Thibault and to Sean is, do you see any, any you know, improvements that Americans and Europeans can understand uh, each other better towards some kind of such a challenge like uh, rising China, you know? Or, or, or that difference still is, is uh, very large. You want to start, Sean, or no. shall I? Well, I'll let you go, Tiba. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, Andreas, uh, we, we've already had this conversation between the two of us. So, so what I'm going to say is not going to surprise you, but uh, I'm always, you know, extremely surprised by this discourse from, uh, uh, from fellow Europeans who say, you know, Europe needs to find a way between uh, uh, between uh, between America and China. Uh, the reality is that we heard this discourse in the 1950s and 1960s, uh, and, 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 and you couldn't be. You couldn't be in between. I mean, you could, you could get a, a sense of, uh, of autonomy, of course, particularly if you were in the West, in the East a bit less, uh, actually a lot less, uh, but, uh, but the reality is that you were on one, on one side of the fence or another. And I think uh, this is what is happening right now. Uh, uh, we, we need to, to choose which side of the fence we're in. And the obvious answer from our point of view, from, both from the interest side and the value side. And I think, you know, when it comes to China, the two are actually intrinsically linked, uh, uh, both on, on, on both these aspects. We have common interests, more common inter interests with America than, yeah, than, with, uh, 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 than with China. So uh, I think the, 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 the discourse actually should be pretty easy and it, it should be pretty easy to speak between America and Europe about this. But for this, we need to uh, understand that uh, uh, the, 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 the days, whether we like it or not, 
uh, that the days of the happy globalist liberalism are over. This is, this is finished, whether we like it or not, uh, uh, and whether President Trump gets reelected or not, this is over. We have Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping in, in, in China, we have Narendra Modi in, in, uh, uh, in India, we have so many other leaders uh, uh, that, that, that basically have already uh, uh, re either re consciously rejected or understood that this, this world was over. So now we need to build a new model and the, the obvious lie that we have in this, uh, you know, in this new world that has become so uh, uh, very dangerous, the jungle has grown back as, as uh, 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 Robert Kagan uh, wrote, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the obvious lies in here are Europe and the United States and together Europe and the United States uh, uh, make up, you know, a very, very big proportion of, uh, of the GDP, of, of, of the world's GDP, of uh, trade, and uh, also of military might. So if, if we stick together, then uh, uh, we are much, much stronger. And, and we need to make that case and we need to, to, to work in that direction. That's at least the, the way I feel about it. Well, thanks, Devon. And Tron, what's your? I, I couldn't agree more. I think, again, going back to not just the economic interests of, of both continents, but the shared values. You know, the democracy, rule of law, freedom of the press. Um, we look at, we get almost daily in the United States about the censorship of U.S. companies, the trade theft from U.S. companies uh, in China, uh, the lack of respect for rule of law. Um, and I think there was a poll that came out um, yesterday or the day before, a global poll that uh, showed China took a significant hit post-coronavirus. Um, within the global psyche of viewing of how China operates its country. And so um, I think there's a, a great opportunity for Europe and the United States to jointly lead uh, because, you know, Thibault and I spend a lot of time, and I know many of you do in Africa, and Europe obviously has been involved uh, on the African continent um, for hundreds of years. But you look at how China has really run unfettered across the, the African continent and some of the positive and negatives that have happened because of that. So I, I think there's again, another opportunity for, for Europe and the United States to lead on the African continent um, as well as obviously Latin America. And then the, the boiling point I think will happen in the next couple of years will be the military growth, the Chinese military growth in uh, the South Pacific uh, juxtapose Australia, uh, who's a very close ally of the United States, um, and then Japan and, and the Philippines. So uh, that will be one one to watch. Uh, I think uh, if there's a, whether it's a Biden or Trump administration, how they deal with that. Well, thanks a lot, Sean. So uh, no, we are coming to conclusion, perhaps. Uh, and uh, thanks a lot, really, to Tibo and especially to Sean. You know, well, you did not answer it our. <laughs> Who's going to win? <laughs> <laughs> but we understand what's what's the reason. At least we 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 know now. You know, Florida, Ohio, Georgia. I, I put even you know Pennsylvania, yeah. Michigan, and Wisconsin. You know, what we shall watch. <laughs> Just watch those. Ignore the rest, and you'll be the yeah. smartest person in the room. You made our, our life much easier, you know, for for for, for coming, you know, next uh, Tuesday, uh, you know, and uh, and that's that's really thanks a lot for both of you. Really, it was very 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 interesting and very valuable conversation, and uh, we learned we learned quite a lot, uh, both about you know, how how we can watch and what what can we you know forecast uh, or, or non forecast not forecast you know uh, elections but also what what we can expect you know from forthcoming next uh, presidential term mm -hmm. and uh, i think that those those exchanges are uh, really very 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 important and uh, very interesting and well i am i am still you know all we we from time to time we're talking with the boss that uh, maybe we can create some kind of traditional, you know, conversations. If, if you know, Colorado people are ready to, to wake up, you know. <laughs> well, Everyone is, uh, Tebow knows this because he's been to my ranch in Colorado. Um, so we have lots of uh, mountains. It's, it looks like the, the Swiss Alps, but we have cattle. We have, uh, 
shotguns, cowboys, all that stuff. So you're always welcome out at my ranch to have a big American steak and wear cowboy boots. Yeah, okay, okay, good. <laughs> so thanks to everybody. Thanks to everybody and good luck, you know, and then let, let's, let's, you know, stay safe uh, during that, you know, terrible pandemic. And, and thanks a lot again for, for, for Thank you all. Presence. Thanks a lot. Thank Bye. Take care, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, people. Bye.